This presentation content has been created by Eclipse Security LLC for Microsoft Corporation. For any questions or comments, please email inquiries at eclipsesecuritylc.com. The Microsoft Compiler Defenses Level 300 presentation introduces the role that the Microsoft Security Development Lifecycle fulfills in trusted application development. It also provides an overview of the runtime defenses provided by current Microsoft compilers. Addressing this subject matter will enable our organization to enhance our application development practices and the security of our applications. Please note it is recommended that the Buffer Overflows Level 300 presentation be reviewed and addressed prior to this presentation. In this presentation, we will complete an overview of the Microsoft SDL, key Microsoft compiler defenses, and the Microsoft SDL compiler defenses requirements and recommendations. The Microsoft SDL is a holistic and comprehensive approach that leverages education, process, technology, and executive commitment to consistently create more secure software internally within and external of Microsoft. Since 2004, all internal Microsoft developers have been required to adhere to the SDL, and Microsoft has updated the SDL every six months to address any emerging threats since its inception. True to its name, the SDL was created to complement rather than disrupt the software development lifecycle. The core phases and principles of the SDL include the training phase, the requirements phase, the design phase, the implementation phase, the verification phase, the release phase, and finally the response phase. In the training phase, every Microsoft developer must complete mandatory security training focusing on secure application development practices. Training sessions include topics such as threat modeling, secure development and testing practices, and security for application development managers. In the requirement phase, requirements for security and privacy must accompany functional requirements of the software that's being created. Such requirements may include the use of encryption, authentication, and other security measures based on the business requirements, exposure, and sensitive data. To that end, a security and privacy risk analysis is performed at this stage. In addition, the threshold for security and privacy, or bug bar, is defined during this phase to ensure that bugs with certain severity are addressed and resolved before the software is officially released. For the design phase, eradicating coding bugs with security implications is not sufficient. Design vulnerabilities can have a substantial detrimental impact on security and are much more difficult to address during the verification phase. To that end, threat modeling is a critical SDL requirement and a Microsoft security innovation that is recognized by analysts as the next evolution in creating more secure software. Through threat modeling, architects and developers at Microsoft are able to approach security in a structured and methodical way from an attacker's perspective. This allows Microsoft to identify and reduce attack surface and mitigate the risk of potential security design issues. The implementation phase is the application code development phase where code is written by developers using industry best practices and analyzed with both internal and external tools such as static code analyzers and special security debuggers to help ensure that those best practices are being followed. Requirements are also specified by the SDL in this phase to ensure that applications are built using the latest compiler versions and built-in compiler protection features. The verification phase is a quality assurance phase within which rigorous security testing is conducted in addition to typical functional testing procedures. In the release phase, the final security review is the major milestone that a Microsoft product team must pass in order to release a product under the SDL. During this meeting, security experts and the development team review all of the activities mitigations, and security artifacts that are relevant to the project in order to ensure that the security quality requirements are satisfied. During this phase, the product team defines a response plan describing procedures, accountabilities, and contact information in case security vulnerabilities are discovered after the product is operational and used by the customers. <laughs> 
In the response phase, after an application is released, the Microsoft Security Response Center, or MSRC, handles any security issues that are uncovered in the weld and mobilizes product teams within Microsoft to provide timely fixes for security issues. In summary, secure software development requires executive commitment, ongoing process improvement, education and training from VPs to product managers to developers to testers, tools to aid in detecting security vulnerabilities, and incentives and consequences to ensure everyone adheres to the SDL process. As was previously indicated, this presentation focuses on key Microsoft compiler defenses and how they can be used to make applications more resilient to attack. With respect to specific phases of the Microsoft SDL, this presentation focuses on the implementation phase. Current Microsoft compilers can be used to add defensive measures to compile code. Most of the Microsoft compiler defenses are relevant to applications developed in C and C++. Furthermore, Microsoft compiler defense mechanisms are primarily aimed towards limiting risk from buffer overflows and other vulnerabilities that can facilitate a malicious user to control the execution flow of an application. All the necessary defensive code is applied to the application by the compiler and not by the developer. This means that leveraging Microsoft compiler defenses requires minimal effort from application development teams. It is important to note that the Microsoft compiler defenses do not fix security vulnerabilities. Applying compiler defenses does not provide a silver bullet that will fix or correct security vulnerabilities that may already be present in an application. However, they do provide additional barriers that make exploiting vulnerabilities by malicious users much more difficult. Furthermore, it is entirely possible for each of the defenses discussed in this presentation to be defeated. Again, they each make successfully exploiting application vulnerabilities much more difficult. Compiler defenses should never be used in place of secure application development best practices. Lastly, the insights gleaned by Microsoft, which are incorporated in its SDL, and more specifically in this presentation focusing on compiler defenses, are being shared with each of you as a way for our organization to enhance our application development practices and the security of our applications. This slide provides an illustration of the runtime defenses applied to applications using Microsoft compilers. Let's take a look at the application compilation process and then see where compiler defenses can make applications more resilient to certain attacks. Whenever an application is implemented, it is first implemented as source code using a programming language. Some such programming languages might include, but are not limited to, C, C++, and C Sharp. That source code is then inputted into a compiler, which compiles the code into binary objects. A linker then takes and transforms the binary objects into a binary file, such as a library or executable. When compiler defenses are enabled, the compiler and linker apply defensive mechanisms that make the application more resilient to certain attacks. When the application is deployed and is subjected to attack, the runtime defenses will help safely deflect certain attacks. However, it is important to note that compiler defenses will not prevent all types of attacks. Certain attacks may still be able to overcome current compiler defenses. This is why the Microsoft SDL recommends using a layered defense in depth approach by implementing a variety of different defenses when developing safer and more trustworthy applications. Let's now take a closer look at some of the runtime defenses provided by Microsoft compilers. The first Microsoft compiler defense that will be discussed is the Buffer Security Checks GS option. This compiler defense has been available since Microsoft Visual Studio .NET 2002 and injects security checks into the application code to detect and prevent certain stack-based buffer overflow attacks that overwrite the saved return addresses. Detection and prevention is accomplished by the use of security cookies to protect critical memory data through rearranging parts of the stack frame 
and by adding code to protect vulnerable arguments passed to a function. All of these defenses make executing stack-based buffer overflow attacks against GS-protected applications much more difficult. To enable buffer security checks, applications must be compiled using the slash GS flag, which is enabled by default by the Microsoft compiler. The GS flag is able to provide a key defensive feature through the use of security cookies. Security cookies are sometimes referred to as canaries, however, this terminology is more frequently used when discussing similar protection schemes provided by non-Microsoft platforms. Security cookies are 4-byte chunks of memory that are initialized with a random value. These cookies are strategically placed in front of important control structures on the stack, such as saved return addresses. The purpose of security cookies is to detect and prevent certain stack-based buffer overflow attacks that try to overwrite saved return addresses on the stack. Let's now review how a malicious user may be able to exploit a stack-based buffer overflow with a standard stack frame that is not protected with security cookies. Then, let's apply the same attack against a stack frame that uses security cookies. As was previously mentioned, in addition to using security cookies to provide defenses from stack-based buffer overflow attacks, the GS flag also rearranges the stack frame and adds defensive code to protect vulnerable arguments within a function. To simplify our discussion and to better illustrate the use of security cookies, those additional defenses will not be reflected in the stack frame shown here. The vulnerable code that will be exploited is the code shown here. Here is a C language function called unsafe function that accepts a character pointer named stir. It allocates 32 bytes on the stack for a buffer called buffer and then copies the contents of stir into buffer. No validation is made to ensure that the contents of stir can fit within the fixed length boundaries of buffer. Therefore, a stack based buffer overflow vulnerability exists in this code. The input that will be passed to this function will be the letter A repeated 40 times. This should be sufficient to trigger the stack-based buffer overflow as the size of the input exceeds the maximum capacity of buffer. Let's now see what happens to a standard stack frame when unsafe function is passed in with the letter A repeated 40 times. Here is the standard stack frame that gets created for a, a call to the unsafe function. The 40 A's are provided to unsafe function and a buffer overflow occurs. When the function completes and the operating system makes preparations to execute the next instruction, called the function epilogue, the operating system will read the value of the saved return address and try to execute the instruction pointed to by this address. If the input contained malicious code, and the last four A's were replaced with the address of that malicious code, now contained in buffer, then a malicious user would be able to leverage unsafe function as a conduit to execute arbitrary commands. Now let's see the same scenario as was shown in the previous slide, but now with security cookies protecting the stack. When security cookies are applied, the stack is slightly modified. A 4-byte random value is placed between local variables and control structures. In this example, it was placed between buffer and the save frame pointer. The operating system will also save the value of the original security cookie in a different region of memory. Now let's see what happens when the same 40 A's are provided to unsafe function. Buffer is filled with 32 A's. and the remaining 8 A's are written over the security cookie and the save frame pointer. When the function is completed and the function epilogue begins, the operating system will compare the value of the security cookie on the stack frame against the previously saved value. If the values are different, then some buffer corruption has occurred and the operating system will throw an exception. If the exception is not handled, an operating system will stop the application and thus halt the stack-based buffer overflow attack. Let's now see a demonstration of how 
The protection provided by the GS flag can be used to prevent the successful exploitation of certain stack-based buffer overflow vulnerabilities. In this demonstration, you will see a buffer overflow attack against a native C application and then use the Visual C++ compiler GS Buffer Overflow Defense to reduce the risk from the same attack. This is a sample C application that will be attacked during the exercise. Several functions are defined within this application. The first function is the function named inaccessible function. This function is never called anywhere in the application and the message printed by this function to stand out should never be displayed. If you ever see the output from this function, then the execution flow of the application has been compromised. This function contains a stack-based buffer overflow because it tries to write a buffer called stir into a fixed-length buffer called static buffer. Static buffer has 8 bytes of memory allocated to on the application stack. If stir contains more than 8 bytes of data, then a buffer overflow attack is possible. After the call to stir copy, the function prints a greeting message to the screen. If the value of stir was passed in as Kevin, then the output from this function will be hello Kevin. The contents of this buffer will be passed into exploitable function. The buffer has been specially crafted so that when read by exploitable function, execution flow will be redirected to inaccessible function and cause it to execute. This is possible since exploitable function will try to write the 16-byte buffer into an 18-byte buffer. The ending 4 bytes are in fact the address of inaccessible function and will be used to overwrite the stack frame return address thus causing execution flow to be redirected to inaccessible function. The main function calls exploitable function and passes it attack buffer as the stir argument. The first 12 bytes of this buffer are simply the letter A repeated 12 times. The first 8, buffer, eight bytes will fit into the 8 bytes allocated for static buffer as defined in exploitable function. The next 4 A's will be written over the saved EBP value on the stack. The last 4 bytes are defined as 00104000 and will overwrite the saved return address on the stack. When a processor is done executing a function, it will read this address back into the EIP register and execute any instructed instruction pointed to by this address. The address 00104000 is actually the address of inaccessible function, but written in little endian form. Little endian form is the address format used by Intel processors. Other processors may use an address format called big endian. This means that if attack buffer is passed into exploitable function, when the processor is done executing that function, it should then execute inaccessible function. Again, this is because the saved return address will be modified to point to inaccessible function by attack buffer. Let's compile our sample code without the GS protection and see what happens. The application printed hello AAA repeated several times, but it also called inaccessible function as shown by the message here. You have now exploited exploitable function using a stack based buffer overflow and compromised the execution flow of the application and caused inaccessible function to execute. Let's compile the sample code with the GS protection and see what happens this time. You notice that we've specified the slash GS option. By default, GS protection is automatically applied by the Microsoft Visual C compiler. 
Notice the difference in execution with the GS defense. The operating system caught the buffer overflow attempt, threw an exception, and halted the process. The buffer overflow attack was unsuccessful and execution control was not compromised thanks to the buffer security checks provided by the GS flag. As previously mentioned, none of the compiler defenses provide a silver bullet for complete protection against exploitation attempts. With respect to buffer security checks, there are certain situations where this defensive measure may not be applicable or effective. For example, if a function does not contain a buffer, then buffer security checks are not applied by the compiler. Functions with variable argument lists are also not protected. Also, if a function is marked with a naked attribute, which instructs the compiler not to generate code for function setup called the function prolog or teardown called the function epilog, then buffer security checks are not applied. These and other limitations listed here are further evidence as to why compiler defenses should not be used as a replacement for secure coding practices. Defensive measures like these are meant to reduce risk and not to eliminate it. The next compiler defense that will be discussed is called safe exception handling. Whenever an exception occurs in code, it is handled by an exception handler. The address of the exception handler is stored on the stack, which could be overwritten and corrupted or hijacked by a malicious user. If an exception occurs and the operating system tries to execute an exception handler at an address that has been corrupted by a malicious user, that malicious user may be able to control the execution flow of the process. The code read worm that exploited the vulnerability addressed by the Microsoft Security Bulletin MS-01-023 leveraged this type of vulnerability and could have been prevented if the safe SEH option was available at the time. When safe exception handling is enabled with a safe SEH linker option, the linker writes the addresses of the exception handlers to the portable executable header. From then on, whenever an exception is raised and the address for the handler for the exception is retrieved from the stack, the operating system will first check the validity of the address before executing the specified exception handler. The operating system will then compare the retrieved exception handler address against the valid exception handler address stored in the portable executable header. If the retrieved exception handler address from the stack is not contained in the valid list of exception handler addresses, the operating system will halt the process. Hardware enforced data execution prevention helps to prevent code from executing in application data pages. Data execution prevention has been implemented under several different names. However, the concept behind data execution prevention remains the same across all such implementations. Data execution prevention is supported in Windows XP, Service Pack 2, and higher. Hardware-enforced data execution prevention works by marking all non-code memory regions in a running process as non-executable. Under most situations, code should not be executed from non-code memory regions, such as application stacks or heaps. Hardware-enforced data execution prevention will detect attempts to try to execute data and halt the process. To use this feature, the system processors on which an application is running must support data execution prevention. The operating system must also support this feature. Most modern day processors provide the support and versions of the Windows operating system X XP, SP2 and higher support this feature. Application teams can leverage data execution prevention by using the compilation linker flag NXCompat. For Windows Vista, Windows Server 2008, and higher, several key operating system images have been compiled using the dynamic based compiler defense. With this compiler defense, the address of those key operating system images in memory are randomized each time they are loaded. The likelihood that any attack that relies on previously known static addresses within those operating system images will be successful is substantially reduced since this aspect of address predictability is eliminated. The feature that enables this randomization is called Address Space Layout Randomization, or ASLR. Also, in order to use Address Space Layout Randomization, data execution prevention must be enabled.
Application development teams can apply the same image base randomization. To do this, the dynamic base option needs to be specified when an application is being compiled. The dynamic base option is available for Microsoft Visual Studio 2005, Service Pack 1, and higher. Let's see how image randomization can be used to reduce the likelihood that a malicious user will be able to successfully exploit a buffer overflow vulnerability. Recall that whenever a buffer overflow is exploited, malicious users need to jump or redirect the execution flow to certain known addresses, such as the address of some buffer they have filled with malicious code, or a known dynamically linked library location. When image randomization is enabled, that known address changes each time the application is loaded. By doing this, Malicious users are forced to guess the new address of, the co of that code that they are trying to execute. In most cases, malicious users will guess incorrectly and the attack will not succeed. Even the address space of the stack of an application is randomized, which means that correctly jumping into overflow stack buffers is also difficult. Again, it is not impossible for a malicious user to correctly determine the correct address of the code that they are trying to execute. However, with image randomization, the task of guessing the correct address of the code correctly is much more difficult. For applications that implement remote procedure calls and component object model code, the Microsoft Interface Definition Language Robust Compiler Flag can be used to provide additional defenses to applications. When this flag is used, the network data representation will perform runtime error checking on correlated arguments in dynamic arrays, unions, and in out interface pointers. A correlated argument is an argument that uses at attributes that allow the size of the data object to be determined at runtime. For all Windows 32-bit C and C++ applications developed using the Microsoft SDL, the GS, Safe SEH, NX Compat, and Robust Compiler flags, when applicable, must be enabled. While dynamic base is not currently required by the Microsoft SDL, it is still highly recommended as it can provide an additional layer of defense to applications with very little effort. In addition to certain compiler defenses that must be enabled, the Microsoft SDL also has requirements on the minimal compiler versions that must be used. Compiler protection has evolved and has been greatly improved upon in later versions of Microsoft compilers. As such, the latest compiler version is always recommended. For details regarding the compiler defense requirements for other architectures, including minimum compiler version information, please refer to the most current Microsoft SDL guidance paper at the URL shown here. This concludes the discussion on Microsoft compiler defenses. Applications compiled with Microsoft compilers can leverage some of the built-in compiler defense mechanisms to improve their resiliency to buffer overflow attacks. These defenses are added to the compiled code automatically by enabling certain flags without requiring any additional effort from developers. While each of the compiler defenses discussed in this presentation can greatly improve an application's ability to withstand certain attacks at runtime, these defenses should not be regarded as replacements for writing more secure code and following security best practices. Each of these compiler defenses reduce the likelihood of successful exploitation but do not entirely eliminate the possibility of successful attacks from being employed. Certain compiler defenses must be enabled for any application developed following the guidance, tools, and processes of the Microsoft SDL. Furthermore, specific compiler versions must also be used in order to ensure that the applied compiler defenses are sufficient to address the current threat landscape. Lastly, the insights gleaned by Microsoft, which are incorporated in its SDL, and more specifically in this presentation which focused on compiler defenses have been shared with each of you as a way for our organization to enhance our application development practices and the security of our applications. This presentation content has been created by Eclipse Security LLC for Microsoft Corporation. For any questions or comments please email inquiries at eclipsesecurityllc.com.